Hey, it's all and welcome back to Warcraft Weekly, the king of your second screen. Yay! Hit the like button once you think I've earned it at least. Subscribe for more content and let's talk real quick about Wrath Classic. The other week, the WoW team responded to Outcry for there to be a second Fresh Start Realm. Now, Fresh Start Realms are like brand new realms for Wrath Classic with no character transfers allowed, there's no boost, no nothing. They also happen to be designated as PvP servers. A compelling realm like that ended up being impacted, much like the mega servers on Wrath Classic, especially after the pre-patch. In a statement, the WoW team responded to this concern, saying that adding a second fresh PvP realm is very, very likely to do one of two things. Lead to both realms being unhealthy in the long term, and essentially guarantee one of the two realms becomes the Horde server, and the other becomes the Alliance server. So as they say, times change. That was two weeks ago. This week, they announced the opening of a second PvP realm as well as free character transfers from the old to the new one, so, you know, I guess their will is a noodle. That or the overall population is swelling so much in anticipation of Wrath Classic's launch that a second realm is definitely going to be needed. But do you think that the original blue post may end up being right? With only two fresh start realms and both of them being PvP, these results seem almost inevitable. Weird to say it like this, but if WoW and Wrath Classic were less popular, like I said, weird to say, it would have been kind of cool to see a case study like this, where we see just one, just a single fresh realm cut off from all of the others, born in the era of Wrath of the Lich King. Like, how would it look? Maybe there's still a chance to find out, but for now, that's where we're at. Whatever the case, Wrath Classic launches in less than 10 days. It's going to be the typical global launch, with Wrath content accessible starting at 3 p.m. Pacific on Monday, which is midnight in Paris, and 8 a.m. Tuesday over in Sydney. Assuming that the day one initial raid content is going to be available, which includes Next Ramus and Eye of Eternity and Obsidian Sanctum, I'm sure that we can expect some world first again achievements in time for dinner. You know, at least it's dinner somewhere. Moving on, for some of you, Shadowlands is over. Oh, okay, heck, for some of you, it hasn't even started. But for those of us who did commit ourselves to it even for a little while, it's nearing that time when things go away. I'll nag you folks in some reminder video down the road, but in the meantime, the WoW team did us a favor and filled us in on what's going away once the pre-expansion patch goes live and when Dragonflight finally launches, whenever that is. When the pre-patch drops, Season 4 will end, meaning Season 4 rewards will go away. You're going to want to finish up your Keystone Master slash Hero achievements get your gladiator rating, and collect your gear. Also, when the patch drops, the Shadowlands raids will be stuck on their faded versions. Why, I have no idea, but it's going to mean that trying to farm up those mythic mounts from Sylvanas and the Jailer up towards Dragonflight's launch is going to be a bit tougher. When Dragonflight launches, the mount from taking down the Jailer on Hurok will be no more, and I already mentioned the mythic mounts will be that much tougher to get. The faded raid achievements are also gone, meaning no more Hero of Fate title, there's no raid teleports, getting the slime cat mount, that's going away too. There's an achievement called We Are All Made of Stars in the Sepulchre Raid. It's doable on normal, but apparently there's a heroic and a mythic version of the achievement too. Do it now because after Dragonflight, those higher difficulty achievements are going to be gone. But you know what's not going to be gone? Soul Shape. The seed of renewed souls will be obtainable at some point that lets you transform into your selected soul shape. Now you can still change it by returning to Arden Wield and talking to that one NPC as usual. But this is pretty much exactly what we were hoping for, a toy that gives us the cosmetic fun of soul shape. Now there's no speed boost, there's no teleport, basically it has no use in combat, but with a supposed 10 minute duration and a 5 minute cooldown, we basically have a way to goof around and AFK. Between the soul shapes and critter shapes, there are 70 to collect, which means I obviously haven't been counting. There's a handy link in the description below that'll take you to a wowhead guide showing you how to collect all of them. Hopefully the toy will make a distinction between whether you're in a rested area or not, because that's how it changes you to either your soul shape or your critter shape, but... That's the WoW team's problem, suckers. This week's Dragonflight beta slash PTR build revealed a handful of things, and at the same time, it's starting to turn the corner over towards endgame content testing. A new server was spun up for endgame focus testing, and right now folks can test out Solo Shuffle and soon Dungeons. 
That's your reminder to check your client in case you got into the beta. From the looks of it, the WoW team has been very aggressive about invites and they've been sending them out in waves. Just as well, content creators left and right have been given a handful to hand out to their fans and viewers. Now I have none to give you right now, but you know, I, I guess they're just going down the list. I have 50 keys to give out. Shut the f up, really? No, for a moment I felt your murderous intent. I mentioned Solo Shuffle and that the rated version of it is up for testing. We also learned something a little bit interesting about the WoW team's plans for rewards. Now from their blue post, players will select which of their specialization to queue with and participate in specialization based ladders and end of season rewards. So they're gonna be gladiator brackets for like tanks and other specs that are typically super unpopular in rated PVP. And I find that to be chaos, but I'm gonna be really interested to see the people be the champion of their specs in Solo Shuffle. And I'm not saying that I'm interested, I'm just, I'm just, you know, asking, but are there any prop pallies out there who've queued up? You know, I'm wondering how long the queue is and, you know, do you get laughed at? And okay, I guess my anxiety is starting to kick in. Reported by Wowhead, we now know the eight dungeons that will be part of Dragonflight's Mythic Plus Season 1. On the Dragonflight side, there's the Ruby Life Pools, Algarthar Academy, Nakhut Offensive, and the Azura Vaults. I would know nothing about those. On the Legacy side, on the other hand, we've got Court of Stars and Halls of Valor from Legion, Shadow Moon Burial Grounds from Warlords, and Temple of the Jade Serpent from Missa Pandaria. Without knowing anything about the Dragonflight dungeons, this seems to be an okay mix of enjoyable and obnoxious dungeons. Burial Grounds and Temple are kind of new to Mythic Plus. I mean, they've been challenge modes, but it's been a long time since then, and our classes are very, very different. Also, those dungeons are fairly linear, especially Jade Temple. I can imagine clearing some extra trash at the start of uh, the burial grounds, but beyond that, it's a pretty straight shot to victory or depletion. Let's take a moment for some visual candy. A set of ensemble gear revealed itself this week, purchasable by two competing reputation vendors. Only one of those vendors includes a shield, so I guess my choice has been made, but each offers a different flavor of black dragon themed gear, and I've gotta say, it looks pretty cool. A while back, I revealed this set of gear earned from grinding up outdoor elites, and this other set from outdoor PvP. This third set here comes in green. The folks over at Wowhead presume that this is gonna be maybe like a pre expansion catch up gear sort of set. I heard there are supposed to be other colors as well, and crafted gear sets are still shown with placeholder pieces and gear. So who knows, maybe crafted gear will be a color variation of this, which I, to be honest, I'd prefer it to be something else. I, I, I don't want crafted gear to be just, you know, some other recolor. Now that wraps up the news side of the show, but I wanted to squeeze this piece here on the weekly. Some of you might have noticed that I've been talking a lot about professions, including the one feature that we obnoxiously don't know too much about, crafting orders. I know I've prattled on about this a lot over the past month, speculating and testing and speculating some more. Now, a reasonable person would just shut up and wait for it to be testable. A responsible creator wouldn't try to assert that an unfinished and untested feature is something that it was never meant to be. Uh, but I'm not that person. Now, I'm not kidding. I'm about to waste this much time theory crafting two directions that crafting orders can go. I don't intend to mislead you. I'm doing this for fun and mental preparation for myself. You can consider this to be maybe a fascinating inside look at how the copium is made. You've been warned, and here goes. So this here is an in-game screenshot inside the beta of a crafting order for a piece of epic gear. This is what a client, the person creating the crafting order, would see when they create one. It's an obvious placeholder, but it tells a story, which starts with this is a placeholder. You can see on the left hand side the reagents required to make this item and a transparent little plus sign for each item. Intuitively, the client sees that they can provide the materials for said item, that's why it says provide reagents here. This includes the optional reagents that can increase item level, customize secondary stats, and all that good stuff. This much is easy enough to understand. There's something missing here though that I'm gonna point out a little bit later. On the crafter side, things get a tiny bit murkier. The screenshot here, which by the way is from the alpha, is an example of a client who provided at least some materials. From here, the crafter can, if they want to, increase the item level of this piece of gear. They'd basically be able to apply a heroic or mythic item level boost. They could change the secondaries if they wanted to as well. 
And those locked icons there, by the way, they're a way of telling the crafter that they're unable to do anything because their skill levels aren't high enough. Anyway, this sort of arrangement is a little bit weird because the crafter can go the extra mile, several miles in fact, and just hook this client up, even if the client didn't ask for certain things in their order. The client can write up their own requests via that chat box, but they can't click on certain things that set a requirement. Say, like, maybe they want certain reagents to be there, and those will need to be provided by the crafter. Let's pretend that as the client, like, okay, I want this gear made, and I want the secondary stats to be a certain way. I happen to not see missives on the market, so I'm just gonna pay the crafter extra and they'll provide their missives. I'll just let them know in the notes. In a situation like this though, the crafter in theory can decide to not change the secondary stats, make the gear anyway, keep the extra money and call it a day. Now, somehow I don't think that the final version of this is going to allow a scenario where the crafter can pretty much short the client. And I believe that on the client side, there's gonna be some way that they'll be able to set reagent requirements. And if the crafter can't make the item to the client specifications, then they're gonna get some error message or the order just won't go through. What I talked about here isn't actually the concern that I have. I'm just using this example here to help you get up to speed on how crafting orders can work based on the story that this UI tells, even if it's not confirmed fact. What I am concerned with are these reagents, which raise the item level of gear to heroic and then mythic item levels. As a sobering reminder, I should also point out that the max item level of crafted gear is 427, while the last bosses from the mythic raids coming in this upcoming season drop gear with an item level of 434. Currently, there's the ongoing question of whether these reagents have to be provided by the client or if the crafter can use their own if they happen to possess them. Because if they can, that effectively enables the trading of these reagents, notably the mythic level reagents only found from top level raids and dungeons and PvP, which opens doors to a lot of possibilities. It basically means that mythic level players who have these epic recipes can offer to sell those specific crafts to potential clients who happen to be looking for them. Players will be creating crafting orders for this mythic level gear, while crafters will take a look and see what they can fulfill. Keep in mind too that from these earlier screenshots, the client is only able to ask for mythic crafts and the crafter is not obligated to do it. So again, a lot of this is going to change. The mythic player slash crafter who has this reagent, they don't even need to be necessarily good at crafting. They only need the recipe to make the gear for the client. Like who cares if the quality is bad or even if the stats are random because then when the client does have this mythic gear, they can go to a more experienced crafter who can adjust the stats, add an embellishment, and especially up the quality to make it a perfect craft. Now this sounds great for the sake of accessibility, and truth be told, I have doubts that the supply of these kinds of mythics is going to be all that high. What I'm saying right now is total speculation, but I anticipate that the mythic reagent will take approximately two weeks for any one person to make. And yet, in a way, the availability of these reagents sort of devalues these experienced crafters who put a lot of time into getting the best materials, the specializations, and the tools to squeeze out that bonus 10 item level from a given craft. Whereas mythic crafter people, they'll be able to just use this reagent that's all they need to do, and they'll be able to get that much more item level. So what if these upgrade reagents can't be traded via crafting order? Well, that would just mean that the realm of mythic crafting is only for mythic player crafters. Crafters with experience, they wouldn't be pointless at all. Mind you, clients can still come to them to up the quality of their gear and to you know, basically bring out its full potential. But I imagine a lot of those crafters are gonna be, they're gonna feel pretty burnt. They're gonna be left in a situation where they can only look, but not actually have that level of gear. And here's a look at how the item level brackets work near the top end. We don't know for sure how Mythic Plus item level brackets are going to work, but as you can see, Crafted Gear has a max potential item level that takes the gear halfway through a given raid difficulty. Now, in case you didn't know, raid bosses in the next season are going to drop gear with progressively higher item level every few bosses. So when it comes to Mythic Crafting, it turns pay to win to pay to... Eh. 
It's going to take some getting used to, and at worst, Mythic Plus is going to sound more compelling than raids, but again, we shouldn't jump to any conclusions too quickly. So should these upgrade reagents be provided only by the client? Can the crafter provide them too, basically enabling the trading of these items? Is the impact of either results going to be as dramatic as some think? That's what we hope to learn soon, as max level professions become testable on the max level realm on the beta. Now again, I, I don't mean to doomsay, I don't mean to complain, this is more than anything me yelling at clouds, because if it seems fun, you know, professions, if it seems fun and profitable, I want to get into this pretty seriously, so I'm going to overanalyze the crap out of this as development goes on, and I'm not going to keep very quiet about it. I want to say one day that in WoW's endgame progression schemes that you've got the big four, you got raids, dungeons, PvP, and crafting, where you choose your path and suffer. And that's the show. This week, the WoW team decided, hey, it'd be a lot of fun if players got to try out double the faded affixes. And we tried it out in Castle Nathria with Denathrius because the clickable ball thing sucked. So we added the barrier mechanic to it. I also got to give a shout out too to folks who had volunteered to join us for this week's raids. It was very, very much appreciated. And if you're a part of our Discord channel, you can see if I'm crying for help Tuesdays and Thursday evenings. Everyone's welcome as long as you're not an Alliance Shaman because I'm an irrational hater. Back to the raid though, long story short, we still didn't kill the boss because we resorted to the double affix tactic a pretty late in the evening, which was a bummer. But I found that to be a pretty cool bit of improvising on Blizzard's part. It added a little bit more fun to this already experience experimental season, even though overall, depending on your playstyle, it was a pretty mixed bag. The coming weeks ought to be really exciting as we check out more beta features, end game testing starts, and folks that haven't gotten into the beta yet can check out the many content creators who have handfuls of keys. Otherwise, just keep checking your clients. I hope you'll join me here on the channel at least as we talk about more WoW nonsense and other copium-filled content. Join us over on stream too. Coffee with Soul happens Tuesdays through Thursdays starting at 8.30 a.m. Pacific. Let's see if we can make partner status before the expansion drops, and I think I just set myself up for failure there. But anyway, a massive thanks to the folks over on Twitch who continue to support me, to our awesome patrons, including newcomer Joyce, yes! Welcome and thank you very much. And to you, viewer, who made it to the end. You did stuff to the algorithm, you're helping this channel grow, and I love you for it. So I talk too much, video over. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay breezy.